May it please the court. Before the short adjournment, I was showing you what actually formed the basis of the judge's decision that there was a respectable body of opinion supporting the use of perindopril for the treatment yeah. of uh, major adverse cardiac events. Mm. Servier's case on this appeal is that there was unanimous expert evidence the other way. In other words, unanimous expert evidence that there was no respectable body of opinion supporting perindopril. Mm. You will recall from yesterday that the expert evidence on which Servier dwelt was that of a pharmacologist called by the health services, a Dr. Coulson. Mm. And that our case is that he was not an expert on primary practices in primary care. There were other experts who covered this question. Mm. He is a lecturer in the scientific study of pharmacology. And if I may go back to the document that Mr. Saunders took you to, uh, Mr. Pitchening took you to yesterday, I apologize, in the supplemental bundle at tab 11, you have there the statement of what he says he is and what his expertise covers at page 155 in the supplemental bundle in tab 11, at paragraph 2, the foot of the page. He says in the third line of paragraph 2, he's offering his opinion on what scientific knowledge was available during the relevant period. And he says, I do not comment on how or the extent to which this body of scientific knowledge filtered through to primary care practitioners or other healthcare professionals. In other words, he did not give his opinion on the extent to which there was reliance and reasonable reliance on local consultants uh, as a respectable uh, body of opinion. However, what reasonably does influence primary care prescribers was an issue that was considered. Mm -hmm. It was a matter addressed with other of the experts called at the trial. There was Professor Brown for Servier. <laughs> there were um, Dr. Durden and Professor Chapman on the health authority side. And I will give you two references to show you what they, as experts, had to say on this matter. The first is on page 128 of the, <clears throat> the bundle. Page 128, paragraph 187, and tab 6. Page 128, 128, this is, this is a part of the judgment in which you see from the heading, the judge is explaining that a patient may be initiated, 185, in primary care or secondary care. Yeah. <coughs> yes. And to um, cut to the key passage in 187, if you read four lines down, the judge says, but even if treatment was initiated in primary care, I consider prescribing decisions of the GP would be influenced by the views of cardiovascular consultants. And that not only was this reasonable, it would have been unreasonable if a GP did not have regard to the specialist's views. And then he quotes the expert for Servier, as Professor Brown has stated, in my experience, hospitals and opinion leaders are, and uh, the judge emphasizes, and should be influential on GP prescribing practices. So that was the expert evidence on Servier's side and consistent with and supportive of the approach that the judge took to this question. Yeah. So far as the health authorities are concerned, one reference to show you is on page 176, at paragraph 360. This is more oblique, but this is the point that one of the jobs that the PCTs face when they are seeking to persuade GPs to 
change their prescribing practices is that they need to obtain their buy-in and in paragraph 360 at the foot of the page, the judge records that um, the GPs would be very influenced by the prescribing <coughs> practices of local consultants. If GPs saw their patients were being initiated on a particular drug in secondary care, which meant the drug had the endorsement of specialist consultants, many would be reluctant to seek to move patients to a different drug, even if the treatment was not for an identical condition. It's referred to by Professor Chapman on the health services side as the halo effect yeah. on drugs of consultants prescribing choices. So essentially, there was convergent evidence by experts of the importance of the acknowledged <coughs> specialists' practices and opinions. It was not simply a question of the expert evidence from the pharmacologist witness talking about his views on clinical efficacy. And my further point on this is that when one does turn to the expert on whom they have dwelt, which was Dr. Coulson, the pharmacologist, in their appeal skeleton and in council submissions yesterday, they have not correctly represented the nature of what he said in court. It was suggested that that witness, Dr. Coulson, had said there was never any rational basis to believe that perindopril was a better choice than ramipril or lisinopril. But what he actually says, as we must now uh, see, about MACE is that although he personally believed there was a class effect, he tells the court that there was at the time confusion in the literature amongst some quarters in the relevant period. And in so doing, he actually supports the judge's point rather than undercuts it. If we go again to the transcript for uh, this, it is in the supplemental bundle at tab 19. Yeah. Mr. Pitchnin took you to the bottom left quartile, page 90. First point is that those, uh, the first lines, <coughs> two to seven, referred to, as we understood it and as is written there, it was dealing with hypertension and summarising evidence in relation to that condition, not MACE. So it was talking there in those lines about uncomplicated hypertension. It is in the following lines that the questioning went on to MACE. And you will see the material evidence given by the witness at lines 14 to 18. The question from counsel was, even for MACE, <coughs> I think your reading of the evidence was there was a class effect. Answer, for what it's worth, my lord, my own opinion is that there is a class effect across them. I suspect from the report opinion writers of the time that there was some confusion in the literature amongst some quarters during the relevant period. So in other words, the expert on whom they do rely is drawing attention to the fact that at the relevant period there was not a consensus. It's not the question of uh, irrational behaviour to believe anything other than that it's a curious, use of fra uh, curious phrase, though, isn't it? Because some confusion in certain quarters. It's not. It's not. It's not saying there was a difference of opinion. In no. Certain quarters. Well, that that may be the effect of it. But um, you know, reading between the lines, he doesn't seem to have thought much of the people who had the confusion. My, my, my lord, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, that was the way he expressed himself. Yeah. Um, he didn't think much of it, but he does acknowledge there that at yeah. the time. Uh, there were different views being held, and that was the yeah. point on which the judge fastened when the judge said that it was sufficient to rely on a respectable body of essentially acknowledged specialists who held that view. And it is for this reason, for all those reasons, that it's not right to say that there was uh, unanimous expert evidence contrary to the finding made by Mr Justice uh, Roth. The second uh, contention that is advanced under this ground is that the evidence that the judge did positively rely on 
in relation to Mace did not support his conclusion. It's paragraph 68 of his skeleton. I shall be brief on that. We've now been through the judgment, and the court has seen what we say is the strong evidence which the judge did rely on, including the presentation of the Europa study yeah. and its reception within the clinician community, which was summarised in very strong terms by Servier itself in the contemporaneous documents, the impact that that study had in changing the views of consultants so that they did favour perindopril as the drug of choice for the treatment of that condition. The next point that they make under this ground is that clinicians were not acting reasonably by following leading cardiologists. And here, in their skeleton, paragraph 72, there is what we say is an unfair characterization of the judge's reasoning in suggesting that doctors are practicing eminence-based medicine, or that they should do that, rather than evidence-based medicine. That is not, in our submission, a fair characterization of what the judge found in the judgment in paragraphs 205 to 210, which are the... Um, the material reasoning paragraphs dealing with Mace yeah. that we looked at, and his conclusion in paragraph 230, Roman 3. On a, any fair reading of those paragraphs, the judge simply found that the superiority of perindopril was an issue on which there could be a mix of reasonable views at the time in question. And it was demonstrated by the respectable body of opinion held by two acknowledged specialists, and that if clinicians shared their view, it would not be reasonable to prescribe another ACE inhibitor rather than the one that they consider to be the best for their patient. Finally, on ground two, there is a point in Servier's skeleton that the judge erred by referring to a part of Servier's defence where they had talked about the evidence base for, for Mace. Yeah. And I can deal with that very briefly. We accept that in the PTA ruling, where the judge dealt with it, not in the judgment, the judge did misread that paragraph of Servier's pleading. On its proper interpretation, we accept that it does appear to relate to hypertension and not conditions other than <coughs> hypertension. However, that is a supporting piece of reasoning in the PTA ruling rather than the judgment, and it does not undermine the judge's decision on MACE generally. <clears throat> now, please, the court, my final group of submissions is on the last ground, ground three. Uh, it is an attack on the judge's conclusion, go back to page 142 of the judgment, in paragraph 230, Roman 4. Concerning treatment of post-stroke and transient ischemic attacks. The judge's finding was that a clinician could reasonably regard the evidence supporting treatment with perindopril as significantly stronger than the evidence for one of the others, ranopril. And Servier is arguing again in this context that is con contrary to the unanimous expert evidence. Our response is the same. The inquiry on which the judge was embarked was not to determine a point of scientific fact about clinical efficacy viewed in the year 2021. It was to determine whether there was a reasonable basis for clinicians in the relevant period to regard the evidence supporting treatment for stroke with perindopril as superior to the other drug, ranopril. If you go to page 136 of the judgment, there the judge sets out, beginning at paragraph 212, going through to 216, a clear evidential basis 
for clinicians reasonably to favour perindopril for stroke. And that included, if you have that in front of you, at 212, the evidence which was given in court by Dr. Graham Smithart, who was a distinguished stroke consultant, who explained the approach that was taken by himself and by many other specialists based on their understanding of one of the evidence studies in this area which had related to perindopril called the PROGRESS study. And that had yielded highly positive results for perindopril in combination with a diuretic. At 213, the judge is referring to guidelines produced by a large group, as he describes them, of multidisciplinary specialists for stroke care in Greater Manchester. And at paragraph 214, you have the evidence of views expressed by two of the stroke consultants in the Bristol region when it was proposed perindopril should be taken off the local formulary. <coughs> you see what the uh, consultant quoted at the top says, page, top page 137, from the point of view of stroke secondary prevention, perindopril is the only ACE inhibitor for which there's any evidence. So very strong terms. Now what Servier does in its appeal on this ground is to attack the reliance on the progress study at all. If you go to, uh, well, we can't go to it in the moment, but Servier makes an argument that even if that study showed that there was a positive result for perindopril in combination with a diuretic, thiazide type diuretic, you couldn't infer reasonably that the drug ramipril would not be interchangeable. However, as the court has now seen, the expert evidence relied on by the judge, and to remind you, uh, the key point here is at paragraph 197 about the lack of consensus in the medical field about how you read um, these, these uh, evidence studies. That expert evidence was that there was a respectable view at the time in question to the effect that specific evidence from studies should be treated as specific to the tested drug. And in the case of the PROGRESS study, the stroke, the two agents that were tested were perindopril and a diuretic, which was called ilapamide. The study results suggested that treatment with those two agents should be considered routinely for patients with a history of stroke or um, transient ischemic attacks. And you see the way in which the study results were presented at page 100 of the judgment, paragraph 81. Therefore, the page before the description of the Europa study that we looked at before the short adjournment. You see at paragraph 81, the title is an acronym again, the Perindopril Protection Against Recurrent Stroke Study. And the uh, features of the study are then described. And the summary interpretation in the study concludes in the way that I have paraphrased in the last sentence. Treatment with these two agents, which was perindopril and indapamide, should now be considered routinely for patients with a history of stroke or transient ischemic attack, irrespective of their blood pressure. Now, Servier's own expert told the court that there was at the time enormous debate as to whether this progress study actually was solid evidence for perindopril itself. And you see the evidence of their witness on page 137, paragraph 215. There, the paragraph be begins by referring to their experts' reaction to the Greater Manchester guidelines. He said they were wrong, 
although he accepted in cross-examination that if a <clears throat> clinician in Manchester followed them, he or she would be acting reasonably, which was a fair concession. And then further, he accepts in cross-examination there was enormous debate as to whether progress actually was evidence for perindopril itself. So this wasn't a situation, again, in which the unanimous expert evidence was that all of this is interchangeable and that perindopril has no special qualities. Their own expert concedes that there was enormous debate at the time about whether progress was evidence for perindopril itself. Some specialists, such as Graham Smithard and those referred to uh, in the judge's reasoning on that paragraph, took the view that perindopril was endorsed as the drug of choice, or was to be endorsed as the drug of choice based upon that study. And finally, Servier itself positively relied on this progress study at the time as a basis for prescribers to select its drug above others, which is the very behavior that its counsel is now telling this court is irrational and effectively a mark of quite extraordinary ignorance. And if we turn again to the underlying document, you have it in the supplemental bundle, back in tab two. If we go in it to page three, first at the bottom. You see clinical arguments, which they are mounting at the time. And under patients with established cardiovascular disease on page three, the evidence base for perindopril, they say, has been extended in patients with cerebrovascular disease, the PROGRESS study. And in the final paragraph, as a result, the findings of Europa and PROGRESS have huge implications relevant to the routine management of at-risk patients in everyday practice in both primary and secondary care. Both studies show considerable risk reductions in the specified primary endpoints and represent the most complete evidence base in these disease areas. Perindopril is the only inhibitor to show benefits in these populations. And then at page 12, you'll see that there's a little appendix devoted to progress. And you will see at the end of the second paragraph on that page, uh, uh, towards the foot of that page, last sentence. As stroke is the third biggest cause of death in the United Kingdom and the leading cause of disability, this unique study offers the most comprehensive evidence base in preventing morbidity in patients who have already suffered a stroke. And so one sees but contrary to the case now mounted in court about the lack of any rational basis for the judge's finding in relation to this, at the time, Servier too was positively harnessing the results of this study in order to distinguish it and persuade prescribers to select it for stroke. So far as reliance on the Greater Manchester Guidelines is concerned, we have now just seen the position of Servier's expert too, was paragraph 215 on page 137. He accepted that if a clinician in Manchester followed those guidelines, he would be acting reasonably. Servier's response to all of this is, in our submission, hard to follow. The argument in the skeleton, at paragraph 75, is that even if clinicians were acting reasonably, even if they were, the real point they say, is that the NHS, in one form or another, should have shared Dr. Coulson's view and taken steps to give prescribers different rational guidance. <coughs> now, as I said yesterday, this sort of allegation is not one of the measures that Servier has pleaded the PCTs should have taken at paragraph 83C. And the judgment records 
and makes findings on the nature of the interactions between PCTs and local consultants. You see that in two places. If you go to page 163, you have paragraph 315, Roman 5, at the foot of the page. And here, the judge is referring to committees, DTCs, or Drug and Therapeutic Committees. These are with uh, um, committees within the PCTs deciding on what action should be taken for medicines management. And it says, DCCs often included local consultants and any proposal to change the recommendations in the local formulary regarding a drug used in the cardiovascular field area would often involve consultation with local consultants specialised <coughs> in the field. The judge finds that was obviously appropriate, and I consider it was eminently reasonable to give considerable weight to the views which those specialists expressed. Although the pharmaceutical advisor, that's within the health authority, may have taken a different view, where local consultants supported the inclusion or retention of perindopril, it's a first-line drug, in my view, the PCT was not acting unreasonably if it followed the advice of the hospital consultants specialised in the particular field and not the pharmaceutical advisor. And one example was given of that in uh, Plymouth. And uh, to similar but not identical effect, if you go to page 172, a little bit further forward, there you have the judgment recording in paragraph 346 at the foot of the page, the challenges of PCTs which were faced with local consultants who favoured perindopril. Uh, it records that where an initiative concerned a particular area of drugs, they did consult the local consultants specialised in that area. There's a reference to the evidence given by Servier's expert, Miss Kerr, about it. If you turn the page and look at the conclusion, the judge concludes at the top of 173, I have no doubt that realistically the view of local consultants would be a significant factor in determining what initiatives could effectively be pursued. Now, the evidence relied on by the judge established that there were and still are many stroke specialists. But it's all over piece, isn't it? Because Professor Brown accepted, even if he didn't agree with the views expressed by the consultants in Manchester, he accepted yes. that a GP who followed the views of those consultants in prescribing would be acting reasonably. Yes. Uh, absolutely, and that is why we said... You know, one, and, and he himself had said, I think it was he, wasn't it, who said that GPs should follow the views of consultants. That's right. And, and therefore to say that the expert evidence was all against the position the judge had taken does not stack up. No. And uh, finally, um, stepping back, you see that Servier's position in the trial is essentially to disavow what it had been doing in the actual real world in an attempt to support a failure to mitigate plea that perindopril was interchangeable with other drugs. And as the judge himself remarks in the judgment, paragraph 64, it led its counsel to accuse Dr. Smithard, the stroke consultant, of, quote, quite extraordinary ignorance of the trial itself. That was misplaced. So for those reasons, we say that ground three equally falls to be rejected. There is one final point which straddles both grounds two and three, and that is in our skeleton at paragraph 70. If you go to paragraph 142 of the judgment... Sorry, page 142, the judgment. This is the point that the paragraphs in 230, which are focused on for grounds 2 and 3, are 230, Roman 3 and Roman 4, which relate to the initiations for mace and stroke in hospital settings and secondary care. Mm -hmm. But those prescriptions are not directly relevant because the cost of them is not 
within the claim. Servier, we say, has not attacked the judge's conclusion in 230 Roman 5 that it would not have been reasonable for GPs, now in the primary care setting, to switch patients who have been initiated by a secondary care consultant. And so, my lords, for, for all those reasons, we say that grounds two and three, the contingent grounds, also fall to be dismissed. Subject to any questions from the court, those are the health services submissions. No, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Oh, um, sorry, before my friend rises. <laughs> I, yes, there is one more thing. Um, yeah. Over the short adjournment, it was drawn to my attention. Your Lordships were all right. There is an order uh, resulting from the 2018 CMC yeah. at which this was made. And there was a judgment, uh, although um, I'll need to show you what it is. May I hand those up and just conclude by showing you the contents of those and their significance? They, have been placed on your desk. Uh, they should have been placed on your desk. <coughs> should they? I'm not sure yeah, I, I have them. Oh, right, OK. Yes, I see. I'm sorry. Yeah, You've got them? Right. And do you want to, where should we put them? Uh, Perhaps you put them in these for the moment. I, I, at, the, at the back of they the supplementary bundle. Um, edition, edition or into, the, into the, additional, the additional bundle. All right. Now, the, um, uh, the first point is the order. Yeah. The order at paragraph 7 is entitled, on page 3, is entitled Preliminary Issues Trial. And you will see there that the issues are set out, but there is a further issue at D. There's A, B, and C, and one at D. And D was, if it's shown that the defendants were engaged at all material times in conduct, whose object was to prevent or discourage switching, are they entitled to raise a defence of failure to mitigate loss? So, what happened was that at the hearing on day two, after the judges' exchanges with counsel that you've seen, we came back and proposed that as well as the issues that the judge had proposed, a further issue should be added. And this was in the nature of uh, a cut-through, which is to say, if you do find that the defendants have behaved in the way that we say <coughs> you will, that should be an end of it, and they should not be allowed to take this any further. This is a sort of killer point. We, 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 we sought to introduce it. In this judgment, <coughs> um, uh, which accompanies the order, the judge considers our proposal to add that. And I make only a couple of points about this judgment, if you uh, would open that. The first is, in paragraph 2 the judge records that there was consensus arrived at concerning the issues covering the framing of the uh, preliminary issues that he had proposed. Mm -hmm. But he goes, so, so that's important because at that point, Servier was in agreement with the issues that ultimately came to be tried. But he goes on to say that given the opportunity to reflect on what may be sensible preliminary issues, the claimants proposed a further one, which was D. And the judge records that this one goes further. This was to be the killer point. And he considers whether it should be added. On this one, unlike the others, there was not consensus. <coughs> Servier opposed it by counsel. And that is the subject of this judgment. Mm. Paragraph 8, the judge explains the issue that he is dealing with in this judgment. Is a party who behaves in this way simply disentitled to raise this sort of defence? He says it's not been an easy question to decide. Ultimately, without the need to go through it, he agreed with us that it would be sensible to add it. And that is why, when you come to the order, there was this additional paragraph D. Yeah. What happened subsequently is that we withdrew that uh, point. 
because we propose that instead the questions of conduct should be dealt with in the way that your lordships have now heard about, which is as an aspect of reasonableness going to the raising of the bar. So, my lord, uh, I bring that to your attention for completeness mm -hmm. and uh, subject to any questions, as I say. Those are the health authorities' submissions. Thank you. My, my lord, can I, I, just in terms of structure, if I may, um, Mr. Pitchenin will respond first on the second and third grounds, and then I'll wrap up on yeah, the first okay. round. Um, can I just deal with the very last point my learned friend yeah. made about the dropping of D? Um, yeah. We'll find. I'll, I'll, we can dig out the reference, but at the time they wrote to us and said we're dropping this because it raises a point of law that we don't wish to maintain. Like that, so I'll, I'll get you the, the, the exact quote for that. But it's, my only friend was that wasn't an entirely accurate summary. Well, it's not. It's not. Um, it's not put forward before this court as a uh, no, no. point of law, which is a killer point because I actually asked. The, some no, it's, it, it's not. It's but but in terms of the shape of what is then, as it were, subsumed within. C. Yeah. One has to be a little bit careful about well, that. The judge part. clearly thought it was of, of um, considerable relevance, and I'm not surprised. Yes, uh, well, my, my lord, it's just one that they decided not to run. Yeah. Um, but, but let me, let, if I may, I'll hand over to Mr. Pitchin and then I'll yes. come back. Thank you. Sorry. Have to. Hello, I have just two points in reply on grounds two and three. The first point is on the substance um, of the comparison that we were making. Um, and my submission will be that there is a fundamental error of analysis running through my learned friend's submissions about the scope of what I'm actually arguing and what we were arguing at trial. And, and that's a, a, a misunderstanding about the distinction between class effect on the one hand meaning that all ACE inhibitors have the same effect. And the narrower contention that I was making, which is that there's no evidence for superiority of perindopril, which is one ACE inhibitor, over ramipril, one other ACE inhibitor. And once you understand that, actually everything my learned friend has just said falls away um, on the substance. And then the second point is about the meaning and relevance of this concept of a respectable body of opinion. And related to that, I'm folding in with that now, um, with the question of what consultants did and, and whether GPs should or shouldn't have followed them. But if I'd like, I'd like to start with the substance. My submission is that I, I am not inviting you to find, and I did not argue at trial, we did not argue at trial, that any rational person would have concluded that ACE inhibitors had class effect for MACE and stroke. We're not inviting you to find that you could just extrapolate from the studies of perindopril specifically, i.e. Europa and progress, and conclude from those results that other ACE inhibitors also have the same effect. That's not my case. And the reason why that's not my case is because <coughs> although both clinical pharmacologists actually agreed with that proposition, so they both agreed that there was a class effect, for MACE and PROGRESS. They also both acknowledged that at the time, there was a lively debate about that. So they were both on the same side of the debate, but they acknowledged that there was a debate. So that's why I'm not inviting <coughs> you um, to find uh, that they were right and everyone else was wrong about that. And as, as we'll see shortly, most of Mr. Turner's references that he showed you from the judgment or from the evidence are all about that question, about whether it could or couldn't be said that all ACE inhibitors were the same as perindopril. As I said, that's not what I cross-examined Dr. Coulson about, and that's not what my submissions to you um, yesterday were about. Instead, that's a narrower point about whether there was any objectively rational basis to prefer perindopril to ramipril alone for these indications. And the reason I'm able to advance that case is that the Europa and Progress studies that Mr. Turner now relies on to show efficacy for perindopril for those conditions actually were just playing catch up with the earlier HOPE study that had already shown efficacy for those conditions um, for ramipril, um, both for, for MACE and for stroke. 
and the perinderpal studies didn't show anything better than that. They didn't provide any objectively rational basis to prefer um, perinderpal to ramipril. Now, th there's a new point um, that my learned friend made, uh, which was not in the skeleton argument, about what Dr. Coulson's evidence actually said on this topic. Um, and you'll recall I said yesterday that there was already a point in the skeleton argument, it's at paragraph 68, about uh, my alleged misinterpretation of Dr. Coulson's evidence. But there's a different point that's been made now, which is that he was actually talking about hypertension in the paragraph that, that I showed you from the cross-examination, um, and that he, he went on later to talk about um, uh, MACE and said something different. And so if we can just go and look at that again. So that's in the supplemental bundle at tab 19, and it's page 90. Sorry, it's internal page 90. The, um, the bundle page number is 267. And just looking at the bottom left quadrant, page 90, you can see that I, what, what actually happened was I just finished on hypertension, so finishing on hypertension. And then I asked them the question, pulling th together all the threads on efficacy, whether we could agree that there was never any rational basis for a person to believe that perindopril was a better choice than ramipril or lisinopril. And he agreed. As I said, we don't need to worry about lisinopril. And, and then I moved on. It's true that I moved on, but I moved on to talking about the other issue. Just to really put the boot in, uh, I also clarified that Dr. Coulson um, actually agreed uh, that other than for MACE, so for everything else, there was a recognized class effect, meaning that um, that not only was there a class effect, um, but that everybody recognized that. And then in the next question, I went back to MACE and said, uh, and actually your personal view as a clinical pharmacologist was even for MACE, there was a class effect, meaning that all of the, of the prills, all of the ACE inhibitors were doing the same thing. And he said, that's right, but other people thought different things, and, and fair enough. And as the Chancellor said, Dr. Coulson didn't think very much of those other views, but actually that, n none of that matters. That's not the question that I'm on. Um, but because this is a new point um, that's been made, um, uh, I have here the full transcript of the cross-examination of Dr. Coulson, which I'd like to show, hand up just to show you the two other places in the cross-examination where I dealt specifically just with MACE and with stroke. So I'm giving you the, the full cross-examination, um, but I'm just going to show you a couple of pages that dealt with that. Because as I said, this page, page 90, which is the one we referred to in our skeleton, we referred to because it was just a sweep up. It was a convenient place to catch everything together. But it was the second time I'd asked him the questions. And if, if you've got that now, um, if you could yep. turn to page 59, um, in the transcript. 59. Yes. And pick it up from line 16. You can see this is after I've just been showing him lots of material about MACE, including Hope and Europa. And I said, so just stepping back and pulling together everything we've looked at on MACE, we have Hope and Europa which provide strong evidence for perindopril and ramipril, don't they? Yes, they do. And strong evidence that they are effective in preventing MACE events uh, in patients not suffering from heart failure, correct. And so while there are some differences in the characteristics of the patients in the trials, yes, yes, my lord, and some differences in the outcomes, yes, it's not realistic to conclude from them that perindopril is any different from ramipril. That is correct. So I take it then, you agree with me, that there was no rational basis during the relevant period on which a person could conclude that perindopril was superior to ramipril for the types of patients that we see in Hope and Europa. That is correct. Other ACE inhibitors, potentially there was a lingering doubt. But between ramipril and between perindopril, no. Absolutely crystal clear. That was the unanimous expert evidence. That was their expert I was cross-examining. And it, it could not have been clearer 
it was a very, uh, very fair witness. If we could go back to page um, 43, this is the section in which I was dealing specifically with the progress study. And I've just shown him the progress study and then I've just shown him some, some commentary on it as well. And we went through all of this in detail and I, I don't want to leave that before you again because we can just take the conclusions. But I said at the top of page 43 that there is no basis in here to suggest that perindopril is superior to ramipril for the reduction of stroke is there. That is correct. It wasn't. We saw a reduction of stroke with ramipril. We did not with perindopril, albeit different populations, and as we've discussed. And then I said, uh, yes, really the thrust of the argument in the paper is an argument for a cross-class effect on stroke, isn't it? That is correct. And then I went on at, and said, because progress also dealt with MACE, I said, for the MACE reduction as well, do you also agree that there is nothing in the paper that suggests that perindopril is superior <coughs> to ramipril. That is correct. So, my lords, the, that was the evidence. That's the, the more detailed evidence um, that I was relying on, uh, that we were relying on when we submitted to the trial judge, um, that there was unanimous expert evidence on this. Page 90 was just the overall conclusion saying the same thing. Yeah. And the materials that were relied on by Mr. Turner uh, are not actually inconsistent with that, at least by, by and large, if you interpret them pro properly. If you could go back to the judgment, um, I, I don't want to spend too long on this, so I probably, probably won't go through them all. Um, but if we go to uh, page 197, I'm sorry, um, sorry, page 132 of the core bundle. And we look at paragraph 197. Yeah. And in particular, uh, I want to look at the quote from Dr. Dwerden, because um, I think this is actually referred to in the Permission to Appeal ruling, um, and, and Mr. Turner placed some reliance on it. But look at what it says. It says, over the period, there was a big debate between those like Professor Brown, who were content to assume that drugs in the same class as in all of them, <coughs> were more or less equivalent therapeutically in the absence of direct evidence to the contrary, on the one hand, and on the other hand, clinicians who had considered that individual drugs should be prescribed only where there was a significant evidence base supporting their use. Um, but my point is different from that. My point is that Ramapril had at least as much evidence, if not better evidence, and earlier evidence <coughs> than Perindopril did. <coughs> So that was, that was one. Another one that my learned friend went to was on page um, 101. Uh, but you said page 101. Yes, under the heading Europa. I see. Yeah. And this sets out one little quote from the Europa study. Um, and the, the judge said that the authors noted that their findings extended the observations of hope. Well, it, in a sense, that's obviously true because hope had shown that ramipril was effective. And what Europa showed um, was that perindopril was effective. And it, it's, it's true that, that they did also make the claim that the risk level in their patients was lower than in hope. But I, I went over all of that with Dr. Coulson, who is a clinical pharmacologist who has expertise not only in the properties of drugs and the reading of studies, but also in how we go about prescribing, how we ought to go about prescribing. And he said that there was no significant difference. And that, that, that's why I put the question to him the, the way that I did in the section I just showed you about the populations at issue in Hope and Europa. There's no rational basis to conclude that perindopril is superior. And there's just nothing here that, if the judge was trying to say here, I'm not sure he was, but if the judge was trying to say here, no, Dr. Coulson was wrong because the population in Europa was lower risk, then I'm sorry, this just won't cut it. Um, I accept the test on the law, as um, Mr. Turner put, put it out, but this is not engaging in with what the evidence was and providing an evidence-based um, answer to it. Um, I, I don't think I, I need to go through um, 
the rest of the references that my learned friend showed you, um, that they're all essentially to the same effect. They don't, they don't make claims that are specific to the, to the effect that Perendipril is superior to Ramipril um, in terms of the outcomes that it produces. And, and the same thing goes for, for the stroke. Um, so um, to, to conclude on this point, once you have the question right, that we're looking specifically at whether perindopril could be preferred, to, said to be superior to ramipril, that there was just no evidence on which the judge could have rejected the views of Dr. Coulson. So that's the first topic. The second topic is this whole issue of the respectable body of opinion. And my learned friend's submissions on this seem to slip a bit. Sometimes what he's talking about is opinion pieces by Professor Fox and Professor Ferrari that are published in you know, some documents that, um, that may or may not be read by people. Sometimes that's what he means. And sometimes what he means is something different, which is the specific situation where you've got local consultants in a hospital prescribing it in a particular way and suggesting that people should prescribe in a particular way. And the question about what local GPs in that area should do is a consequence. And I say that those are two different things that we need to look at um, separately. But on, on the first of those, M Mr. Turner said that what the judge meant by a respectable body of opinion was just an opinion that was held by consultants who are respected, whether or not their opinion was objectively rational. And uh, as I said yesterday, it's not crystal clear to me of reading the judgment, in particular of Para 176 and 175, whether that is what he meant. Um, but it, it actually doesn't matter for my appeal, um, because either way, the judge is wrong. Um, so if the judge thought that the opinions he was relying on, like those of Professor Fox and Ferrari and a couple of doctors in, in Bristol, were rational, then he was wrong. Because the, the unanimous expert evidence in the relevant field of expertise in front of him um, explained why those opinions were not opinions that any rational person could hold if they looked at the right materials. That's the point, that's the first of my two points that I made. And obviously I, I couldn't cross-examine Professor Fox and Professor Ferrari, and it wasn't my job to cross-examine Dr. Smithard on whether he was right or wrong in his views. That wasn't what he was there to call, uh, he was called to give evidence on. Um, but we, we say when you look at the relevant evidence, there's nothing there. So that's the first hypothesis. The second hypothesis, which is the one my learned friend is on, is that the judge thought it didn't matter whether the views were rational. But if that's what he thought, then the judge was wrong about that as well. Because the expert evidence was that that, that old approach <coughs> of eminence-based medicine, it was called, where you just follow what you know learned um, people in the field say, um, had been discredited. And instead, what Dr. Coulson said um, was that prescribers should either reach a correct, objectively rational view based on clinical outcomes um, that are demonstrated in studies, or if they're not competent to do that, and lots of doctors aren't, you know, lots of doctors aren't competent to understand p-values and t-statistics or chi-squared tests or any of these things, then what they should do is follow the authoritative guidelines and it's, it's paragraph 22 of our closings, um, which is on page 279 of the supplemental bundle. I showed it to you yesterday, which guidelines those are, and not one of them supported perindopril as being superior to ramipril for these conditions. So that was another source of expert evidence. It's not expert evidence on what the studies tell you. It's expert evidence on clinical pharmacology itself. How, how do we go about prescribing? Um, what is a rational, proper, evidence-based way to go about prescribing? And that categorically was within the scope of Dr. Coulson's expertise. It's what he was called to give evidence on, and he did. And nowhere does the judge engage with that or say why it's wrong. So that's why I say if the judge meant that you could just follow a respectable body of opinion out there in the ether, then, then that was wrong. A different point is whether if you have uh, a local consultant who is prescribing in a particular way or is telling you to prescribe in a particular way, um, or even if you've got local guidelines that tell you to prescribe in a particular way, 
actually, whether they're from consultants or not, they might be from your PCT as well, then you should follow them. And you saw what Professor Brown said about that, and, and <coughs> we agree. Indeed, this is our whole case that, that doctors should prescribe in the ways in which they're, they're told to prescribe. But that just begs the, the question of what should they be told to prescribe? And if a clinician, and a consultant is a clinician, is, has formed a view that is objectively irrational, and the NHS knows that, the National Pres Prescribing Centre knows that, then the job of the medicines management team in the PCTs is to do something about it. Go out there and persuade them. And, and that's, that's part of how they bring about the shift in behaviour that we say they ought to have been bringing about. So the real question about this topic, which is local consultants, which is a different issue, the real question here is not at the level of A at all, as in issue A and B at all. It's not about substitutability um, or about whether it's appropriate for someone to prescribe perinopril instead of ramipril, vice versa. It's about issue C, which is, are we right? And now it's added, was this something we were arguing at all at trial? Are we right that the PCTs should have been going out there and doing something about it when they encountered obstacles of this kind? And that is not a question for me. It is a question for my much more learned friend, Mr. Saunders. Okay. Um, so he, he will be showing you that that, that was squarely within the, the, the scope yeah. of the trial. In fact, I, I've already showed you yesterday to steal his thunder that there was a whole section in our closing, written closings on it, which quoted extensively from our cross examination of the, of the witnesses. But unless um, your lordships have any questions for me on, on, on A and B. No, thank you very much. It's me done. Just before I get going on our substantive uh, reply submissions, can I just deal with this point about the deletion of D? I can just quote to you the paragraph of the letter, just so that it's on the transcript. Sorry, about what? About the deletion of that final, the knockout blow D, oh, the D paragraph. Yeah. So it's in the letter of the 10th of January 2019, and the paragraph uh, reads, we also consider it appropriate to deal with preliminary issue D in view of your request for information dated 30th of November 2018. Upon reflection, the claimants consider that, as formulated, issue D identifies a proposition of law for which the claimants do not contend. For the avoidance of doubt, the defendant's marketing efforts remain relevant to the remaining preliminary issues which encompass considerations relating to the standard of unreasonableness that they should apply given the circumstances of this case. Yeah. So that, that is just so my lords are absolutely clear about the circumstances yeah. in which that was wrong. Um, my lords, can I, can I, th there were three themes in my own friend's submissions, the case management theme, as it were, there's the marketing theme and this question of clear standards and how they're to be applied and uh, uh, how one goes about doing that. Can I, I'll address you, if I may, on each of those themes, but before I do, can I just highlight something of an elision at the heart of my learned friend's submissions, which is between the need for Servier um, to show a failure to observe clear standards, on the one hand, and the need to show that every PCT and health board in the country needed to, show exact, to take exactly the same steps, and presumably at the same times, in order to make good our mitigation, uh, mitigation defence on the other. <coughs> and that, that, in my submission, is an error, error because it's entirely possible, as we've submitted on, in, in our skeleton argument, to answer the preliminary issue C, the third preliminary issue, um, by reference to generally accepted or clear standards, but without the answer being a binary answer that was necessarily the same for each and every PCT that standard may be manifest in different PCTs in different ways. If, for example, by a big spending PCT that spends a lot on perindropil, it may be that they should do a local formulary. If not, if a small spending one doesn't, then that standard may mean they don't need to do that. And, and so it is not, it, it is perfectly possible to approach that question of standards more generally, with, without having to descend into the individual detail of all of the PCTs, that was obviously never the purpose of this trial, and the, the judge, learned judge, never heard evidence on, on that beyond Plymouth and the Ronda and, and, and so on. But that was there to inform him of how these different things, in, in my submission, may be manifest in different PCTs in different ways. 
Now I have to come on and address you on the case management aspects and the scope of pleadings and, and, and so on, but just to make that point clear up front. Um, the, well, there are a number of more general points which I think are important to bear in mind, if I'm, as I may suggest. The first of those is that much of the evidence that the court heard below, or at the preliminary issue trial, um, made clear that what should have happened at a local level depended on local priorities. That was Miss Kerr's evidence, our expert, um, it, it, to which the claimants did not object. Um, it was also the evidence of the claimants' witnesses and experts. That doesn't mean that there isn't a generally accepted standard. It just means that the standard depends on local circumstances. The application of that standard depends on local circumstances. So, for example, if we, if we think about switching, one of the things that Ms. Kerr said was um, that rather depends whether you have a switching scheme in place or, or script switch. It depends if you've got script switch. Don't want, she wasn't suggesting that you should go and install software that nobody ever had, but if you're using it, you just set a flag in the software to, to deal with this. So those are standards which would be manifest in different places in different ways. And as it were, they're conditional because it, some PCTs would, would not be, it would not be appropriate for that PCT, and for other PCTs it might well be because they're using script switch throughout. How could you express such a standard? Well, uh, my lord, well, the, I, you, you, I think you'd express it conditionally. So in, if you take the example of script switch, the, the way to do it would be something in, in a PCT which is uh, updating script switch software for its general practitioners, a prompt should have been inserted in the software to guide general practitioners to prescribe a generic ACE inhibitor for a new patient. Uh, unless, uh, do, do you see what I mean? So one, one could do it, one could set it in, in that way, but by looking at the conditionality, or where, for example, one's looking at a, a particularly high spending PCT. And so let's take that example, the script switch one. Does that apply across the board? Or if uh, it's a particularly high spending PCT, or dependent on the nature of its population, or what its other priorities are, is, is, is it subject to more conditions, or is there no. one particular standard that, regardless of any other circumstance, if you are updating switch, script switch software, you have to do that? Oh, well, my lord, for, <laughs> on that particular example, if you've got the software, if you're using that software within that PCT, you should have updated it. If you're not, then we're not saying that you should have, the PCT should necessarily have made the investment to change all the GPs in its PCT. I mean, that, so, so the standard would be expressed to be... that depends upon the local circumstances. It just depends on whether they've got script switch or not. Yes, you see, the, and so... The, the, as what really saying is if they've got script switch and they haven't put in a prompt, then they should do so. Yes. By definition, if they haven't got script switch, then there's nothing they need to do. But none of that depends upon what the priorities are. No, exactly. I mean, by law, they're, they're, as it were, criteria that sweep across, yeah, and then the manifestation of them. Which people who've got it got to do a certain thing. And, and I can't remember, is that right? Was it, with script switch, was there stuff about um, not having too many messages? Yes, so, so there were other... Three, six, eight. Crowding out, crowding out. Yes, exactly. So if you get a sort of blizzard of information, then that's a factor to be... So, so if there were a PCT with other concerns, <coughs> then it might not be appropriate to put this thing into script well, switch. Although, my lord, the, the, the other concerns, if you're thinking about the other priorities, they may be, for example, that they were particularly concerned about the bill for statins in that PCT. Um, and this... The, 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 the doctor in question is rather cat handed on the keyboard. He wouldn't be prescribing a statin for the person who's in front of him with a high blood pressure. So um, one would hope. I mean, certainly, I think there is a sort of uh, uh, that one of the concern. One of the the evidence did show that that doctors, much like many other professionals, are not terribly. One remembers the blue plate paper clip in Microsoft Word many years ago that used to pop up and do annoying things. Um, uh, GPs are a bit like that as well. If they get annoying messages all the time, they just click them off. Well, I think it's what was described in Ms. Kerr's evidence as um, alert fatigue. Yes. 
but, but my lord, this, this is in... The number of judges in this building will suffer from the <laughs> Well, yes, my lord, I won't comment on it. <laughs> but, but, um, but, but, my lord, if you, if, if you take that example, if you have... I mean, it, would be, it was perfectly open to the judge to have looked at those. He heard evidence on those and could have found these conditions and how they wash across. If one had a PCT with high principal spending and they had the script switch, then they should have done it. Uh, uh, and you know that at least identifies then a flow down, which enables us to examine that PCT in, in more detail in, in due course. Um, but where we've ended up instead is just a complete bar on any of those local issues, which we, we say at the very core of, of this claim, because that is ultimately how this is a, an ensemble between claims made by a whole group of PCTs all of which have been subsumed into one claimant, but that, that it is an ex an exquisitely local thing to begin with, and it remains an exquisitely local thing. So the question is, how does one approach mitigation in that context? Now, obviously, there are case management issues there, and I'll come on in a moment to how that developed, but um, it, it certainly isn't, um, you know, the, it's certainly open to the judge to have identified those standards, and as it were, one can think of a sort of flow chart or something else as to exactly which uh, uh, made findings as to who was who was of importance. And, and, and just to be clear, I mean, this suggests you would have had a really very complicated set of individual standards, and no such set was provided to the judge, as I understand it. Well, my lord, no. So they're not. Um, first of all, my lord, they're not that complicated because the, the judge heard evidence on each of these elements. Some of those he was not terribly persuaded by, you've seen the, the long. Um, but for example, the evidence on local formularies was one of them. That was an easy step. The, uh, our, our expert explained that actually, and we saw from the Plymouth evidence, that if you do it, it saves a huge amount of money quite quickly because doctors follow, stick it up on their notice board and off they go and they don't prescribe Perindropil. It's down there, lower down, they'll do Ramipril first. So if it's a high spending, um, if it's a high spending uh, a PCT, stick yeah. in a local formulary. Now, again, one doesn't have to, I mean, you demote perindropil within the local formulary. One doesn't have to then spell out individually, PCT by PCT, what should have been done. I mean, we don't have to descend into the detail of Plymouth to come to the answer on that, but it is a, a absolutely straightforward criteria. And there aren't that many of these things actually at the end of the day. And how they wash across the, the group of what are in effect co-claimants for their own individual claims it is manifest in, in different ways. So, my, my lord, I don't, we, 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 in my submission, it isn't actually that difficult a, a job. And when you look at the extremely detailed findings which the judge made on all of these different steps, it's actually not that hard to then take those. And, and um, so, as I say, some of them we weren't successful on. Others were not really in dispute, as <coughs> we've seen already from the joint statement. Um, so that's the first point. Secondly, um, the, the, contrary to what my learned friend said, um, it was always clear that this kind of uh, standard, but manifest in different ways in different uh, PCTs, was one way that the preliminary issue trial could end up. Um, there was certainly no preclusion of that being a, or, or an alternative case or an order that we could have appealed. I'll come on to, to that in more detail in a moment. Thirdly, we say that Servio's marketing efforts did not mean that we had to show that every PCT or health board needed to take the same steps. Um, again, the marketing and the evidence, as you've seen reflected in the judgment, was that some reps were more <coughs> successful than others, and, and it is, again, a locally manifest thing. There was one of the examples I think we heard earlier on about one of the consultants who uh, what Servier had identified as a key opinion leader in that particular PCT, they had a proponent for, for a perindra pill. Um, now, one can entirely see why that in, that local, in those local circumstances, GPs prescribing may well have followed that particular consultant's guidance. But that doesn't mean that, that, that the marketing across the board meant that, um, that, 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 um, that, that everybody in the NHS was following it. 
Uh, it, it's, it's simply that those steps are being taken, and the other evidence, I'll come on to that in, in, in a moment, was, uh, so again, this is, as it were, the manifestation of this is at, at a local level. And that, that is, we say, some of the, really the, the sort of, um, as it were, kind of logical difficulty with the approach that, that the judge has, has taken. Yeah, because um, your, your client's marketing, according to that document, focused on the, on the PCTs who were contemplating switching. Well, my, my lord, so they were, yes, and that's... So the poor, so, poor PCTs that didn't contemplate switching d didn't get the the, um, the hard sell, as it were. Well, Unless I, they suddenly changed their minds. Uh, my lord, I think, like any... I mean, they have finite resources, obviously, and they focus their, their efforts appropriately. That That is an internal document. What we yeah, didn't we don't have... Know, what we don't know um, is how many PCTs were actually... Or, I don't think there's anything in the judgment that tells us how many were targeted, but I imagine it was quite a few. Well, my, my Lord, the, I can take you to the findings on that in, in, a, in a moment, but the, the one of the points about marketing material more generally is a lot of the materials in the case were actually Servier's international materials, and so they were not UK materials, as we dealt with this in our closing, the relevant section of our closing. Um, and I'm, as I say, I'm not seeking to challenge the judge's findings of fact in relation to this, but where, where, where one does have to be careful is using this as a, mm. a, as a kind of re, reassertion of that paragraph D uh, by way of almost a sort of marketing or behavior estoppel um, by the back door, because it isn't, I mean, the, 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 the facts are as found by the judge, but the consequence of those facts at a local level is going to be very specific. Some PCTs it will have affected, other PCTs will have been, as my lord, the Chancellor said a moment ago, left, well, less of a focus, left alone. And that is just the nature of uh, the exercise. Um, well, can I just, so, so I mentioned a moment ago about Ms. Kerr's evidence on the minimum steps. Um, the, so, we, and my lord, I was referring to script switch and the local guidelines and, uh, and so on. You're going to be a little while, aren't you? So I think you've got perhaps yes, to exactly. take a five minute break. Well, I'm grateful.
Apple was a fraud admitted. So just, just for your notes, yeah. the, the, in relation to script switch, um, so it's paragraph 4.44 of Ms. Kerr's report uh, where she says if, where a GP practice had script switch or equivalent software, as, as a minimum, they should have used that to encourage prescription of less alternative, less, important, less expensive alternative ACE inhibitors. Uh, so that's page 150 of the supplemental bond, paragraph 4.44. Um, now, my lords, just in terms of, as it were, the forensic history of how these points developed, at the time that evidence went in, there was no objection from the claimants at the time of the evidence. I'll come on to how the objection was maintained. Sorry, when, when what evidence went in? Oh, I'm sorry, the, the expert evidence yeah. from, from Ms. Coe. Yeah. Um, so this was in 2019, so we're now in 2019. Yeah. Um, and, and that, in my submission, was slightly unsurprising, given that their own witnesses agreed that what it was reasonable to do depended on local priorities. And you've been shown Ms. what Ms. Watson said. We quoted that in paragraph 30D of our skeleton argument. Each PCT would have distinct local priorities. Um, you also see that from the joint statement, uh, where, um, if I could just take models back to that very briefly. So it's um, uh, proposition, so we need Joint, we are, so I'm sorry. Supplemental yeah, I've got it, thank you. So, so tab 13 in the supplemental bundle. Mm. And I showed you, my lord, page 185. I, I drew your attention to Proposition 31 on that page. Mm. Proposition, have a look at Proposition 30. Where a GP's practice was spending higher than the national average, or the PCT Health Board average, prescribing based inhibitors should have been reviewed by the PCT Health Board and highlighted by the prescribing um, advisors. We do not agree. Professor Chapman's view is it's more likely for monitoring and review to have been a context in, the, in relation to ACE inhibitors and AR, ARBs rather than ACE inhibitor use alone. Ms. Kerr said otherwise. Now, my lord, obviously there's a difference between the experts on, on that one, but it was all, th these are joint propositions that uh, the experts, it is a long document which was produced on the 24th of July 2019. Both parties were involved in preparing the agenda and um, were involved in considering drafts produced by them. There was no objection at that point to these questions or suggestion that these nuanced specific things were irrelevant to the preliminary suit trials as they had been ordered. Now, obviously, if that evidence had been accepted, 
by the judge, one possible answer to the preliminary SUC would have been that it was there was a generally accepted standard, but how that standard was uh, to be applied depends on the local circumstances of the relevant PCT. Um, so, my lord, the, 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 there was no objection at that stage. Um, now, it was always clear, we say, that this was one possible outcome, and there was nothing that was precluding it, us from arguing it at trial, contrary to what my learned friend submitted. Um, you've seen multiple times now, and I don't need to go back to the mask skeleton argument for the January 29 CMC in which Ms. Bacon, QC as she then was, pointed out that the outcome may vary depending on local circumstances. Um, my learned friends also took you to the judgment of the court following that hearing. Um, so, uh, and he highlighted paragraph 22 of that, so that's tab 16 of the authorities, where the judge said that if the preliminary issues were decided one way, that will obviate the need for massive and expensive disclosure. That was obviously right, because if the claimants had won across the board, there's no need for a massive disclosure exercise. Um, but that is the judge effectively opting for a case management decision which only works effectively if one particular result is obtained. Well, that's often the case with uh, well, trials of preliminary well, issues. No, of course, and that's often why they're used as a, a litmus test. But yeah. that's, I mean, the, 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 the law has, my lords, and this court in particular, has identified a series of tests about the appropriateness of a preliminary issue mm. in those circumstances. Not least, does it cut through a large number of issues at trial, swing, uh, swing Mason and those, those authorities. Um, this, this case was not quite like that, and the judge, I, I don't have the reference to hand, but actually said this is all, almost like staging part of the trial slightly earlier than it would otherwise be heard. And so this isn't, it's a slightly different beast, because we, which, when one looked at it in relation to the usual test for a preliminary issue, it's very difficult to see, absent that one particular outcome, how what we ended up with would have been a would have met those those strictures that this court has imposed. I mean, it's not as if it's, we're dealing with a point of construction in relation to a particular agreement or whether there's um, some other short issue that can be tried without enormous need for disclosure and, and so on. I don't quite follow why that doesn't help the other side. Well, I mean, if the judge thought that there was a real prospect of the outcome of the preliminary issues saving all this disclosure, why isn't that consistent with the other side's case? Well, my lord, I think it's consistent with the judge saying this is why the preliminary issue should go ahead, because if the defendants had won everything, which I, I accept they did, um, but it, but if they had won everything, oh, sorry, the claimants had won everything, parties the wrong way around, um, then that is that is the outcome, because uh, as we've seen in the order, judgment for the claimant, um, but. That, that is the only circumstance in which, or, or we are entirely successful at everything. Um, but it is only in those two extreme positions that this case management step would have worked. But what, what in your case, you, the, the possibility of the first, the, the first possibility was really extraordinarily, uh, it was almost impossible. Well, no, no, my lord, no, we don't, we don't say that at all. Um, it just depends how the evidence came out of trial. I mean, this is, so our appeal is, we, as I say, we don't challenge the judge's very detailed findings of fact. Well, and when one looks at that summary, which I took my lords to in paragraph 230, I think it was, the, where he summarises the issues on those two conclusions, we take that as read. But um, if we'd lost those first two issues, <coughs> issues one and two, A and B, that'd be it. We'd be dead in the water. But we didn't lose those two issues. The evidence didn't come out quite as cleanly as it needed to for the purposes of a, a, a clean sweep by the claimants. And then the question is, having been successful, at least in part, we say, or on those issues, as one's seen in, in that paragraph, what is the consequence for the, for the proper approach to see? And there, it is only where one looks at those very brief section, that very brief section of the judgment, those three critical paragraphs, which we've spent a lot of time on, that one sees what is in effect, we, we would characterise as, as a, a shutting of the door <coughs> to, to any further argument in the light of those earlier findings on in, in, in paragraph 230. So I, I entirely accept, uh, as it were, that the, 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 the rationale for this as a, 
a, a, a theoretical rationale for it is entirely legitimate. If, if one, if, if they had won entirely, or if we had won entirely, then sure. But we were, we, where we actually ended up was in the hybrid position, which Miss Bacon, uh, as she then was rather fortuitously identified, which is a sort of factual suit. Uh, and and um, I'm sorry, you're, you're, uh, We were shown the transcript of the hearing on the 18th of January 2019, in which the judge put this point specifically to Miss Bacon, that if the claimants succeed trial, the mitigation defence fell away? Yes, that's if they succeed across the board, yes. But, but we say that the judge, well, we say the judge, this is why we're here, because we say the judge fell into error when considering the third the third preliminary issue in the light of his findings on in paragraph 230. Right. I mean, that is, that is the fundamental basis of the appeal. You, um, you've put that both just now and, and yesterday on the basis that, that what we're concerned about is, is 388-391, but at the end. What, one of the things that Mr Turner said was that that leaps over all the findings, where he goes through each of the specific steps pleaded in, in whatever it is, paragraph 80-something C, and, and rejects each of them. All your seven all your seven complaints, together with whatever it was you're complaining about and your further information, he goes through each of them in turn, in detail, and dismisses them. And why is that not a, a, a correct, or something that was open to her to find on, on the preliminary SUC? Well, my lord, because when he is doing that, in my, in my submission, he wasn't looking at the consequence of those findings by way of identifying <coughs> the standard. So, so what, we, what we have in 2.30 is we have the judge identifying that in certain circumstances it was reasonable, for example, to initiate a new patient on 20 milligram. Uh, 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 on another ACE inhibitor rather than Perintropil. Um, what what the judge's findings don't don't do was was um, go through and descend into how those principles should be applied across the board to, to the individual PCTs. He was rejecting the proposition that those steps should have been applied to all PCTs and health boards universally. But he doesn't consider what the, whether there is a criterion which enables one to identify, as much as we were, uh, I was addressing uh, my Lord Justice Newey on a moment ago, about, for example, script switch and its manifestation in a local PCT that happened to have it installed and was ready to roll. Uh, and so just ask that specific one. He does deal with script switch. And yeah. Does that not rather cover the ground? Well. Well, we say we say he makes a series of findings about script switch, but only at that high level. What he doesn't do is then go on to consider whether all PCTs. He, he approaches that on the question of whether all PCTs or health boards should have done it, as opposed to the specific issues uh, and the manifestation of it going going through. I'm sorry, I'm, I may be, maybe it's too late in the day, Mr. Thomas. I'm just not following your submission on this at all. The, the third preliminary issue required the judge to go through each of the steps that you said should have been taken that were set out in your pleading and answer whether or not it was, whether or not it was unreasonable for the claimants to have failed to take those steps. That was the, yes. that was the question. That was the issue. He did that. Well, he went through each of the steps that you said should have been taken. And what he found at the end of the day was that there was nothing in any of them, because that, because you hadn't established that there was any general standard in relation to those matters that should have been complied with by the claimants. Well, my, my lord, in my submission, the, he he went through them on on a, on a, 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 a as it were on an aggregate basis, but he didn't consider whether there was a. Uh, the, the manifestation of those would have affected individual PCTs in different ways, as the evidence um, w w was was addressing. Can I just I test it with script switch, which as we've been talking yes, about? Yes, of course. I mean, the judge ends up at 369, he says, taking all this into account, I do not consider that it was unreasonable that the medicines management team chose not to include alerts for perindropol on script switch. Now, that suggests there is no relevant, there can be no relevant criterion. You, you just don't need to do it. 
Oh, well, my lord. And he deals with that. He, he deals with it at great length. I mean, you, you referred us a moment ago to Miss Kerr's... Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's Kerr or Carr. Oh, Miss Kerr. Miss Kerr. Miss Kerr. It's his Kerr. Miss Kerr's uh, report. But the fact is that he, he, the judge, sets out a passage from uh, Mr Turner's cross-examination of Miss Kerr, which um, is the point about alert fatigue at paragraph 368. And that's the context in which the judge comes to the conclusion he does at 369. Which is even if you've got script switch, uh, it's not unreasonable if the medicine management, medicine management team didn't include an alert for pen for Well, uh, my, my so lord. What, what's left to argue about in relation to script switch? Well, my, my lord, the, the, if, we, if I can just look at three, we, we looked a little bit at 370, just over the page. So um, the various steps in, that need consideration, they had an incentive scheme and so on. Um, and then uh, the reasoning sort of applies to those PCT health boards with higher than average uh, levels of prescribing. Um, and um, as Professor Chapman put it during cross-examination, you may recognise there's no particularly aberrant prescribing. You may not choose to direct your resources for so great to be on source work. That is entirely reasonable, but that again is, is, is dealing with the local priorities as they apply to that uh, PCT. And if you look at, in my submission, those paragraphs on the <coughs> switch in particular, what the judge doesn't consider is, is whether a high principal prescribing PCT with uh, no problem with statins, for example, should be, uh, should have used script switch. So, so just reversing back to where we were, this standard that the judge, you say, should have formulated is not if you happen to have script switch you should insert something into it. It is, if you happen to have strip switch uh, and you're uh, uh, a high... Higher than average level of prescribing. I don't, yes. I don't know how you know whether you're above average or not, but anyway, uh, th you could formulate something, could you, saying... Well, you know, you, they know that they're... So they have reports often, and so what we saw for the ones that we saw in detail is they have reports showing where they're spending a lot of money. And I think there are also strategic health authorities produce documents showing where they rank the individual PCTs as well. So, so if you have seen from a recent ranking that you come high <coughs> uh, and you don't have some other priority about statins, which presumably you might well have for the same reasons because you have an older population, I mean, it becomes a very complicated standard well, and it wasn't suggested to the judge, as I understand it. No, well, my Lord, but, but the... the, the the, the difficulty is that if you approach, I mean, this, this is the inherent difficulty of the exercise to a certain extent, because what the judge assumes is that these other priorities existed and were, were reasonable everywhere, because what he takes each of these elements in the abstract and then says, well, there are some other priorities that may balance up against them. Uh, and so one has to inquire, much as we see here at the end of 370, it's entirely reasonable for Professor Chapman to so, say, well, you've got to, you may decide to stick your resources somewhere else. Well, that inquiry can only be uh, 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 an inquiry that relates to the priorities of the circumstances of that particular PCT. But I think a few minutes ago you were explaining that you don't need lots of disclosure what? to formulate the standards. So it must be possible to formulate a standard that applies to script switch, regardless of looking at the circumstances of individual PCTs. So what would it be? Well, my, my lord, we would say that in, in relation to a, a, if it's a PCT with um, higher than average levels of prescribing, where script switch is already in use, they should set the flag. Even though they might be worried about statins instead. Well, and, well and no, but my lord, you see that the, the, we've got to. The question is, is, is uh, the question is, how does one approach this preliminary issue as as a matter of principle? If if the preliminary issue is. Uh, to, uh, there, there are different ways. If, if the binary answer, there are three possible answers. Claim has been on everything. There's a, 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 a kind of um, evidential mix, or the defendant's been on everything. Um, if we're not in the circumstances where the claimant's been on everything as a matter of principle, then the outcome of this trial, as was suggested a number of times, is that it will be an evidential mix, and we will have to then go off and make an inquiry of whichever PCT, Dartmouth or wherever it is, um, uh, and find out whether there was some particularly um, uh, 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 aberrant 
uh, uh, problem in 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 that PCT. And that on the application of the standard, it shouldn't affect the form the formulation of the standard. Well, and the trouble, as the judge said, is no alternative standards were formulated. But but my lord, the difficulty is uh, this. This comes back to his his illustration. I'm not suggesting in any way it's it was was a. Um, uh, you know, the, the, that it was improper for him to have approached that, but he said that's why he said 40% for two years or something. But even the, the difficulty was that we were not in a position to formulate that before trial. We've now been informed by having cross examined all of these witnesses and seen the evidence, and as a matter of case management, it's much, not much easier. And our proposal now is that one starts by identifying high prescribers, so the hot spots on the evidence that we saw at trial. And then one considers the reasonableness of what they did and why by reference to the individual factors. You know, for example, if you take script switch, if they've got script switch in place, why didn't they make a change on script switch? If they're using local formularies and the local formulary is listing perindropil as the top line, why didn't they put it down the list? Uh, and, and my lord, that is the inquiry which then needs to happen going forward. But the question for my lords is fundamentally whether it's appropriate at this stage in the case to give for, for the judge to have given judgment on the entirety of the defence. And the, the fundamental point that we, we make is that actually this exercise has been a useful exercise. And as a matter of case management, what should now happen is my lords should, uh, if you're with me, should, should um, uh, 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 vary that judgment. And we should um, then be directed to go off and and identify how to find these uh, to, to find these high prescribers in the light of the evidence that the court's heard, and then consider good directions as to how they're to be tried. Now, uh, just on that point, one one thing which my learned friend said is he was talking about the unreasonableness of the exercise. We heard at trial from in, in relation to three PCTs, or one sorry, one health board and two two PCTs. Or maybe two health boards, one PCT. Um, so three, three individual sets of circumstances. We got through that evidence at trial in a day and a half. Now obviously there was a lot of preparation behind the scenes, but actually the live witness evidence is not an onerous task. If one ended up with thirty of those, it is not. We're not talking. This is not going to help, Mr. Saunders, because each of these is on your case. Each local PCT has its own. What priorities has it has its own is different from every other PCT. Is the point oh. that Sir Geoffrey Voss made um, seven years ago? But the lack of you know um, homogeneity. Yes. Uh, oh. Heterogeneity, as Bowen describes it as. So everybody's different, and if you're going, <coughs> if what you're inviting, if if what you were inviting the court to do is to decide that every health authority every PCT in the country that failed to mitigate its loss, then you'd, every one of them would be entitled to have it, it, it say. Well, but, but my lord, th this, this goes to my lord's observation that earlier on. That would be, um, that, would lead no, well, a that. that would lead to a trial that la would last about some 12 months. Yes, I, no, my lord, we're not suggesting, we're not suggesting that. Even more billions of pounds than it's already cost. No, we're not, we're not suggesting that, my lord. And, and it goes to my lord's I'm observation. I'm not entirely sure what it, what it is that you are oh, suggesting. Oh, well, There's going to be of any practical, uh, uh, any sort of, as it were, practical difference from the point I just put to you. Well, my lord, can I can I just can I just deal first with the point which, so my lord, when my learned friend was on his feet this morning, um, mm -hmm. I think my lord was asking about the position, he said, well, imagine one establishes a position in relation to Devon, and one, how does one know that that's indicative of Scarborough? Well, that, that of course, is the same problem which <coughs> Lord Lewis and identified in those interflora cases, which is that if a member of the public comes along and says, I'm terribly confused between this, you know, the Nike swoosh and that thing on that trainer, um, <laughs> how do you know whether that member of the public is indicative of 17.4% of the population or 282 mm -hmm. or is this, you know, possibly even somewhat misguided individual who is a... One of those cases I had was where they were a sneakerologist who collects trainers. Um, so you know, it, 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 you, you can't, uh, my lords. You know, that's the trouble you see because this evidence in itself does not, without having the statistical underpinnings, does not. Because what you're doing is you're taking something as a proxy for other people within the class. Yeah. 
And so you need what Lord Justice Lewison says in this forum is not shutting out this exercise, but one has to do it with a proper statistically valid survey. Yeah. Now, it is possible to do that work because both parties did engage people and it was agreed. They couldn't agree about the parameters of it, but the exercise in itself was something that was that kind of something could be done. But actually, one can be much better informed now that we have been through this exercise. And if we pick, having seen how the, the money, because the hotspots of prescribing equate in this claim to where the damages are suffered in large part. And if, say, one, you know, as a matter of case management, one was, we were told, right, pick your top 20 or pick your top 30, then that still means there is a lot of value left in this defence, potentially, as opposed to us being shut out of it completely. Can I just try to distinguish two possible exercises? Yes. One is you formulate a set of standards, then you ask yourself in relation to a sample or lots of PCTs whether they met those standards that you have by now expressed. Presumably you don't need any disclosure at all to do that. Uh, I think if you, as long as you have sufficient data to identify whether they're exactly where they sit, but, no, sorry, to formulate the standards. So yes, no, not to formulate the standards. No. So that could have been done. That could have, that, my lord, yes, in terms of the standards themselves. That was a potential way through to see. Um, so that, that could have been done at trial. Well, my lord, we're not, we weren't in a position to, 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 to formulate <coughs> those, I think, in, a, in, a, in the kind of statistically reliable but way. You don't that the need judge statistically them, reliable things, do you? If you're formulating standards, the statistics don't come into it. Well, my lord, the, the, the conditional standards of the sort that, that the experts were putting forward um, are things that we did rely upon. It's just that the judge did then not identify that the manifestation of those within the individual PCTs may arise in a, in a particular way and didn't let that part of the case proceed because he effectively shut us out in relation to not having, at a much earlier stage in the case, identified a series of standards right, which I, would then would be... what I don't quite follow. I, mean, um, if, 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 I think he was saying earlier, well, you can formulate the standards without further disclosure. So it could have been done at trial. No further disclosure was needed. But the judge wasn't given any standards. Now the suggestion seems to be, we forget about formulating any standards. We go off and get disclosure from some sample PCTs or lots of PCTs, and then we come back and ask ourselves whether they did all that they were supposed to do. I don't quite follow how that uh, fits. No, well, my lord, I think the, the, the position, so, so we are now informed by the trial, having had the benefit of cross-examination and the, those individual witnesses. What, what we are saying is that in the light of that experience and having seen the evidence that was produced and how that evidence came out in cross-examination, it is, it is possible to identify in a rough and ready way some uh, a, a proposal, for example, starting with the high prescriber hotspots in Dr. Dwerden's evidence, and then approaching these questions in, in the light of that. Um, that was not something that was open to us earlier on, because the judge, in his reasoning, says, well, um, this was never an alternative case that was pleaded, um, and there would have been RFIs and, and everything else. And then he makes the point very fairly that this wasn't a, uh, a, a, a kind of technical pleading point. We could have plumped for some particular figure. But we couldn't do that at that stage until we had been through this exercise. Whereas now, as a matter of case management, we, we, we can, in my submission. And I am going to shut up a little bit. I'll ask you one more question. What happens to all the judges' findings on this basis? The judges made lots of findings. Do they stand? No, well, yes, we're not, we're not saying that any of that should be overturned. Um, the, 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 the question is now, in the light, so... Which where, part what, of your plea the case didn't the judge deal with? Oh, my, I'm sorry, my lord. Which part of your pleaded case did the judge did the, did the judge not deal with? Well, the effect of the findings in it, as it washes down into local PCTs and health. So eighty three C sets out seven, I think it is. Yes. Steps that you say should have been taken. Yes. Each of which he dealt with in detail from paragraph two six nine onwards for I think over a hundred paragraphs of judgment. Well, well, I do accept that, but he did it on on the basis of uh, 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 
and across the board standard when the evidence that, in front of you. That's the basis on which it was formulated. For example, the very first one, page 153 of the judgment, paragraph 270, national level guidance. Well, those, my lord, some of those very first ones are national in nature. And then scripts, which is another one we looked at that. That was all done on, on, the, on the basis of, of what it was said um, should have happened if you had scripts, which it being accepted that not, not everybody had it. And then there's another one which I've, I've there's the quality, what's it, framework and QRF. Yes, the, that's the quality, the, the, the incentivization of GPs. Local formularies, and deals, deals with that. Uh, yes, well, but he, but he did, what he does not then go on to do is to say, to, to address whether, so it was common ground, as I mentioned to my, my lord earlier on, that it was not unreasonable to, not to remove, uh, it, was, it was common ground to, to, to demote Perindra Bill. Um, now the question is, how does that, in what circumstances, how does one identify a criterion which would then wash through into the individual PCTs? And we're not, um, my, my Lord, the, the, there is a, a, I think perhaps the one way of expressing what, what we say is, uh, the, has, 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 has gone wrong in, 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 in the judgment. The judge has said that it all depends on local priorities and resources. That was the evidence he heard on both sides of the case. Um, that, so, so that is an aspect of the standard. Um, so we need to go and see if a small number of my prescribers had good reasons for not doing what we say should have been done, or whether some of them, um, th th there was no reason to justify their failure to take steps. If the hotspots are not taking, are not demoting the on their local formularies, then why on earth not? It was an easy and effective step. And it would have saved, <laughs> uh, potentially, it would mean that my client is, if it, if it turns out it was unreasonable, then my client is, um, it, it shouldn't be liable for, for those damages. Now that is not in any way fettering the claimant's right to bring the claim. It's just properly inquiring as to the circumstances of the individual which makes up the aggregate. And, and my lords, just, just, I mean, it is a minor point, but it is important to just bear in mind that the, the uncontested evidence at trial, Servier is not, Servier is a, a slightly unusual pharmaceutical company. It is a um, not-for-profit company um, which reinvests all of its profits in research and development. So this is not, I know this is, as it were, a slight like jury point, but it, it is, you know, when one's looking at some of the public policy issues, which I think my lords were attracted to a moment ago, there, there are countervailing considerations mm. in that in that respect as well. Um, so the question is, what is it fair and reasonable, what is the, the just outcome in those circumstances for the damages that Servier should be looking <coughs> for in, in relation to this? Um, now, um, my, my lords, the, the, the um, we, we looked, my learned friend showed you the, the order um, obviously, um, what we first say in relation to the order that listed the preliminary issues, I think that's gone into the additional bundle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the order following the January 2018 CMC. And um, my little friend very properly took you to uh, the written paragraph, which is uh, paragraph seven on page three. Um, so you see the issues that are ordered, but look at, look at C, which is the one that went through. Was it unreasonable for either the present three sets of claimants or the relevant predecessor organizations, including PCTs and SHAs, to take any and if so, which of the steps? So it is, um, it is that that's, it, it, it is, there is nothing in my submission in that which suggests that the answer has to be a binary answer. It is one that in itself, as ordered, incorporates the specific. It includes the PCTs and SHAs. Um, paragraph D was dropped, as my Lord, I've already addressed you on that. So the high watermark of my learned friend's submission, as it were, in relation to the genealogy of the preliminary issue trial, is that at the PTR, 
the judge said that the preliminary issue is looking at the conduct of the claimants across the board. Now, we've looked at that judgment a number of times. Um, actually, maybe if I may just, just deal with something, my own friend said, so could we have authorities tab 18. <coughs> So, if we, so the context of this, as I addressed you yesterday, um, was in relation to the fit between Ms Kerr's additional step, minimum steps, which I took you to, and the pleading. So that was the concern. Not, it was not a concern about the, the, the flushing out, as it were, of that preliminary issue into the individual PCTs. And then the key paragraphs are 21 and 22, on page 869. Um, I addressed you on those yesterday, but the point I make about it now in the light of my learned friend's submissions is that it illustrates the, the elision in my learned friend's argument on, on this ground. In paragraph 21, the judge says that the preliminary <coughs> issue is looking at the conduct of the claimants across the board. Oh, sorry, of the, of, of, of the, um, it's, uh, the claimants across yes, the board. Across the board. Uh, and is not concerned with the conduct of particular PCTs. As I said, of course, that is fine because it's right that we only had evidence from three particular PCTs at trial. The judge couldn't possibly go broader at this exercise. But that doesn't mean he couldn't have answered question C in the kind of across the board way that we're saying by dealing with the, the, the case that some of the PCTs that had higher levels of perindrapil pill, perindrapil pill prescribing should have taken some <coughs> particular steps. So there's nothing in this ruling that that, that in some way limits or changes the scope of, of, of that. And the, the critical point, again, is that there was no order coming out of that that was adverse to Serbia. You see that from paragraph 22. No evidence was being excluded at this preliminary issue trial. The judge said it will all be considered within the confines of the preliminary issue that's been ordered on the pleadings as it stands. Well, that's absolutely fine for me. And the judge declined to narrow the preliminary issue. Yeah. So, and, and, and so, my lord, there's no order in this case that precludes us from making those arguments. And actually, when one looks back at what was ordered by way of the preliminary issue, and one looks at the pleadings, the pleadings are about local formularies. The preliminary issue, as ordered, is about the predecessors, the SHOs, and the PCTs. It is an exquisitely local exercise. Now, the question is, how does one deal with that fairly? in the light of uh, that, that is you see, in the light of the evidence that the, the judge heard and what is to happen to as you see um, in, in that light. And if I may, I'll just come back to that in a second after dealing with the, the marketing efforts briefly. Um, in relation to the marketing efforts, and my learned friend obviously places great evidence, uh, great weight on, on those, um, the judgment does not say that the marketing activities mean that every single PCT and health board needed to take the same steps. That would have, if the judge had said it, been a, a rather bizarre thing for the judge to have concluded. He didn't make that finding because the reasonableness of a PCT steps depends on, um, uh, is to be assessed, taking into account our marketing activities. We don't shy away from that, but whether, to take my Lord the Chancellor's example, whether the, the, the van stopped in a particular PCT to, to advertise Servier's wares or not, depends on what, what happened in that PCT. Now, it may be that when one looks at the hotspots on the map and we pick, say, the top 30, they've got a very good argument because if you take, for example, the one that, that, that we heard evidence about, that particular PCT was the subject of extremely intense marketing by Servier. And in, in the light of that, in due course, the judge will conclude, well, there's nothing in this because that one was, was the reason it was prescribing so much was because you had put a huge amount of effort into to marketing there. That is a factor which, as it were, subsumes the other factors for the purposes of assessing reasonableness. But, but the, the point we make is that doing this across the board is something that is, is, is it, it's, it's much like the manifestation of the position in relation to the individual PCTs, you can't, it isn't a knockout across the board. I can, I can see my lord to not find it an unattractive position. I don't shy away from that. 
but, but um, uh, I mean, the, the, when one thinks about it forensically, it either is or isn't a prevailing factor in individual PCTs. So, my, my lords, um, the, and, and uh, just for your note, in our closing, we deal with the evidence on this uh, paragraph 174 onwards, but I, I don't need to take you to that now. Uh, one of the things that the medicine management team says is they say that this is their job. Um, it was described, I think one of the one of the witnesses, Dr. Buckman, described this as propaganda that he receives. And the medicines management, Mrs. Watson, we can quote in our closing at 183, 184, said that her job is to stop this, um, what was characterized as propaganda. And that, that is something because they receive it from um, all drugs companies, they issue guidance which doctors have followed, uh, and so on. Now, it may be that in some circumstances, Servier's marketing efforts have created <coughs> a local consultant to include Perintropil at the top of the list. So that's obviously going to mean for that PCT, we're, we're, we're in some difficulties, I entirely accept that. But what it doesn't mean is that across the board, marketing is, is it were, as it were, a sort of a stop uh, as against the entire case. That is the thing that was dropped as a point of law by, by the defendants. Uh, by the claimants, such as. Um, so, my lord, we, we say the judgment, what the judgment doesn't rule on is, is that, that our marketing activities show that every PCT or health board needed to say, take the same steps, nor does the ruling say that the judgment uh, has said it. Um, it introduces a general standard, uh, and um, but um, well, there may well be uh, 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 how, how that implements across um, uh, uh, into each individual PCT is, is a factually uh, relevant matter. That's paragraph 388, and it reflects our, our submission there. Um, the, the 389 reflects our argument on the basis that it wasn't pleaded. Just to deal with the pleading point, my lord, even Mr. Mr. Justice, oh, I don't mean even Mr. Justice Henderson, Mr. Justice Henderson, rather, uh, the very first time a judge had seen this, plea when he had to consider whether it should come into the case or not, identified immediately that the local consequences of this exercise, this, this plea, were going to raise a series of exquisitely local issues in relation to each individual PCT. And that has always been the basis on which, as a matter of case management, the court, uh, Mr. Justice Roth and, and, and uh, Sir Geoffrey Voss and, and the other judges who have uh, uh, seen it, uh, uh, and um, the, the, there is no suggestion, it was always acknowledged and recognised that the consequence of that pleading was an individual, uh, required an individual assessment. Now, in the absence of an order or a determination by the court shutting us out from those individual assessments <laughs> at a PCT by PCT level, um, my lord, the, 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 that, all of that was live. I accept that if the judge had said, I'm going to rule on you, rule against you, sir, the eight, and I'm going to say that actually, if you see, I'm going to modify, I'm going to delete individual PCTs, and we're going to do national standards, and then we're going to take it from there. If, he, if the court had done that, we would have been attempting to come up here to see my lords rather earlier than we are now. But the, the, the position is that the first time that that had been ruled upon in that way is this judgment. Well, your counsel at the time, and certainly his counsel at the time, was well aware of what the consequences would be. The judge put it in a fair and square at that CMC. What, my, my and she agreed with him. And she didn't, and she's, you know, she was um, well able to, uh, to, to uh, give advice to the effect, well, that's going to be the consequence of what, uh, what the judge is ordering. And if we don't like it, we're going to have to go to the Court of Appeal. Well, my lord, but it wasn't, there was no order from the court well, at that stage. Whether there was an order or not, they could have gone, the order was the order to, to uh, for the preliminary issues. You could have made a challenge to the to the preliminary issues on the basis that that was the effect that the judge intended them to have. Well, my lord, but the, the, the Miss Bacon, as the, the, she then was at that stage, went on to address the judge on the difficulties in, in dealing with all of this. Uh, later on in that, that was actually in the context. The specific context was the decision of the general court. It wasn't actually, she wasn't making <coughs> the point that you're now making. But the consequence of what the judge was ordering was tolerably clear, wasn't it? 
Yeah. Well, my, my lawn's. I, I, I'm, so I, I'm told you now that maybe we can assist you with a transfer. Well, it's apparently. It's, it, 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 yes, I think it's tab 11. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm afraid my lords, we don't have the entire transcript, but I can <coughs> arrange for that to be sent to my lords immediately because I think there are some later sections in the transcript where where she does say precisely the thing that my lord, the Chancellor, was concerned about. Mm. Can I come back to my bifurcations? Yes. Um, if to look at this in a proper way, PCT by PCT, you needed full disclosure. Then he needed to challenge the refusal of disclosure issue, and that wasn't done. Uh, well, so the disclosure was stayed, my lord. Well, he needed to challenge the staying of it then, because it wasn't on this thesis possible to proceed satisfactorily to determine the preliminary issue without having the disclosure. If, on the other hand, you didn't need the disclosure because it was possible to formulate standards without any disclosure, then you didn't do it. So all the judge had to do was decide on a different basis. Well, my lord, the, the, I think the, the, the position in relation, I'll have to check with those around me because I'm afraid I only came into the case for this trial, but the, the, I think the position at the time of the, the stay was that was in, in the context of a slightly different discussion. About my lord, if we just have two seconds. Mm -hmm. just to yeah. My, my lord, so the 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 the, um, the position, as I understand it, was that the uh, at that stage we were <coughs> standards in broad terms, but our case has always been that the general includes the particular. My lord, yesterday was asking the question about what what happens if we only succeed on uh, items A, B, and C. If there's no one say, suggesting that D, E, and F are, are ruled out, uh, and that is, in my submission, the correct way to approach the the, the question. It, it applies not only. Not only are all those things not a unitary block, but they're not a unitary block, as it were, horizontally across all the PCTs either. And, and so. I, as you'll gather, I can see the force of that, rightly or wrongly. But, but that's only stage one. It's within the scope of the pleadings. But nevertheless, <coughs> when you get to the preliminary issues trial, if you want some halfway house, you've got to explain what that halfway house might be. And in circumstances where you haven't got disclosure for the PCT, that you say, well, that's all right, because I can formulate standards. It must have been surely incumbent on you to formulate the proposed well, standards. My Lord, but, but the, the, at, at, at what stage? Because we, the, the difficulty was that we, I mean, we had a, this was an extremely intense trial, I think as the judge may have mentioned at the end of the judgment, but um, we, we were dealing with the issues there uh, rather than fundamentally reformulating the case in a way that would have required the evidence to have been flushed out differently at trial. That's the trouble. We're, it, I mean, there's a catch-22. The, the formulation is, is informed by what we have learned through the forensic process of going through the trial. But if you raise a, an amendment at that stage, um, it's as a matter of case management, it doesn't take much for a judge to say, well, that's in, absurd, because you're now suggesting that we have to rerun the last six weeks of trial. Um, so th there is a, uh, there is a fun this is quite unlike that sort of case because it, often one has late amendments in the run up to, to a trial where there's a, a dispute about the late amendment. But actually it is the, the fact of the trial that gives rise to and, and the, 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 the development of the evidence through the trial that gives rise to the ability to, to now be able to do what I'm trying to suggest in my lords is, 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 is a sensible way forward as a matter of case management here. Can I try and test your proposition, going back to the example of script switch? The pleading is, the claimant should have written a, an alert into, into script switch. Now I understand the point that that may be capable as a matter of construction of the pleading to mean either all of them should have done it or some of them should have done it. But the case you run I think at, at trial is, is that all of them should have done it. If you've got script switch, you should have done it. And what the judge says in 369 is 
I take everything into account. I do not consider it was unreasonable if the medicines management team chose not to include the lungs. Now that is an across the board finding, but is it not a finding also for, for each well, P PCT? It's, it's not, I mean, it's not consistent with that to say, but there are some where it might have been appropriate and some where it wasn't. And it, if, so if that finding stands, it, that, that does shut you out across the board, doesn't it? Well, no, my Lord, because it's not a finding. So, so the way that the, the, the findings in the judgment work is that each of these issues is considered, as it were, in isolation. And then they're compared against the other priorities. So, so if you take that part of the judgment on script speech, what the judge acknowledges at the end is there could be other priorities that affect a particular PCT. Yeah, but, but, but the finding is, you, I do not consider it unreasonable if this must mean in any particular case the medicines management team chose not to include it. But, and if you'd wanted to say to a judge, you can't answer this question on script switch, unless you answer it in our favour. If, if you're against us, you have to say, the only answer you can give is, well, it all depends. And then you could have asked him to, to say that. And if he'd said that, then you could have had another another trial, depending on what it all depended on. But he hasn't said it all depends. He says, he says it's not unreasonable. And as I read it, that means for all PTT, if that was the decision the medicine management team came to, that's fine. Well, but, but my lord, the, the, what, what he's saying there in my submission is that, that, that in the light of the evidence, so he heard evidence from the medicine management team saying they had a number of competing priorities. Um, what he is saying is he's saying that if in the light of those other priorities, they didn't go for script switch because of the other priorities, then fine. But that begs the question of whether for a particular PCT, those other priorities are operative to mean that script, script switch is down the list. No, because the, the, the way in which the judge has answered the question, you could do the same analysis for the other, the way in which he's answered the other <coughs> questions with respect. And that's why he reaches the conclusion he does in paragraph 391. Because what he says in 391 is you, you fail to establish there's been any breach of the, of the general standards, which are the ones, which are the clear standards, however you want to describe it which are the ones which you've pleaded in paragraph 83C. Therefore, um, that's the beginning and the end of it, which is what he'd said at the case management hearing. And that's why he says uh, at the end of that paragraph, don't consider it either proportionate, necessary, or just to postpone an answer to third issue, allow for detailed disclosure of <coughs> individual PCTs. Um, but, my lord, the, 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 the point that I would make about that and to deal with, my lord, or Justice Nugent's question in particular, is the way that the judgment works, and the reason that I don't need to challenge the individual findings on each of the headings, is that those are, as it were, within the silo of that particular finding. But each of them is expressed uh, uh, relative to other other priorities. Now, it, it, so it is only... Read, a, you read what, this as, as being a finding that if... In, any, in the case of any particular PCT, they decided that the local priorities were such, then, then that's fine. That's not unreasonable. Well, no, my lord, what, what, we, what we say is that, that it is only in paragraph 391 where all of this is joined together, uh, uh, as it were. You see, the, the, whether there are other local priorities in a particular PCT, is, a, is an issue for that particular PCT. But it is only, it, you see, this is why, it, it, just to go back to 389 and 390, this is why we have the, the judge criticising us for not identifying much earlier in the case some sort of cut. Uh, and my lords have just heard my submission on, on, on that a moment ago. But um, that, that would enable a sort of a fillet of the overall PCTs to, to be identified. It is only in that paragraph 391 that, that, that all of this is drawn together and the, the, the consequence of, as it were, the individual atomization of the, <coughs> the, the pleadings, but without looking at the, the PCT context, is that, that in 391 all of that is, as it were, joined together and the reduction reductionistic approach does not actually deal with the bigger question, which is 
how is that applied in the local politics? That's our, our submission. Well, I think we've got your submission. Yes, well, I, I, um, the, the, can I can I just address you very briefly, finally, on the public policy angle, which is Stellantis and my lords, uh, yeah. the, the chancellor. Um, so, so you, um, we don't disagree with there being a public policy angle generally. And that, that is, of course, always the case in torts, where I mean, where there have been issues before the courts about assumption of duty and, and, and so on. That's why Lord Nichols was uh, talking in those terms more, more generally. But um, one has to characterise the nature of the tort before getting to the question of whether the procedure and the evidential rules have been uh, violated. What we're proposing here is nothing, uh, in my opinion, <coughs> we don't get anywhere near as high as the test which my lord uh, Lord Justice Green identified in, in Stellantis, where there is a, uh, has a justiciable right, um, must not be allowed to become so onerous. This is a, a, a very big case it, it, financially, it's several hundred million pounds are, are claimed. This defence could potentially be worth tens of millions, possibly even more. And the question is, is it fundamentally fair, uh, and is it, uh, as a matter of case management, in the very unusual circumstances in which this, this issue was developed and the way that it was developed before the judge, for Servier to be shut out of uh, running, uh, of inquiring into, say, the top 30 or the top 20 prescribing well, pieces. Another way of looking at it is to say that for a number of years your clients overcharged in ways they did in breach of competition with you and um, have had the benefit of NHS and therefore taxpayers' money for a long period of time. Well, my lord, I and I. Cuts both ways. No, my lord, I accept. And that's that's the whole point about the public policy. That's what a point. Is. Well, I mean, I follow your point that it's not like <coughs> anybody suggesting that this is like um, the because the Stellantis case was part of the truck situation. Yeah. Um, and that's obviously a commercial. That was a very extreme example. It's a suggestion. commercial example, which is quite extreme. I agree. Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, my, my lord, I mean, the equivalent here would be that we would be, our mitigation defence would be suggesting that uh, the PCT should have saved money on a drug from GSK or something by clobbering G. I I mean, that, that obviously would be a yeah. moonshine, that defence. Um, but that's not what we're saying at all here. The question, this is a question of whether, in, in the circumstances, um, it is as a matter of, uh, of um, uh, whether the judge fell into error in those three critical paragraphs in the approach that he took, uh, and we say that he, he did, <coughs> because the effect of that was to shut out, in, in relation to in particular the hot spots that were identified at trial, mm -hmm. some of the, uh, the 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 fact that this for those pe those that, that that relatively limited number of PCTs should should um, go forward <coughs> to be determined in more detail. And that is not a, 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 you've had my submission already, I won't labour it, but we're not talking about sort of John this uh, revisited. This is a, you know, a day and a half for three of them, or maybe two days or whatever it was, but it was not, you know, this, this is something that in a ca case of this scale is not an unreasonable um, step. Um, my Lords, I think unless, uh, I'll just, um, if I may just check. Of course, of course. Uh, yes. Okay, good. Um, my Lord, can I just um, ask to clarify one other thing, just in relation to the comment my Lord made. Um, Servier has never overcharged anybody. The NHS has paid the price of Perindra Pool because... Yeah, I mean, um, but the, the basis of the, um, the commission decision is that there was... Yes, it's not an overcharging, uh, just my clients were very keen to... Yeah, it's, it, its effect is overcharging. Uh, well, it's, it, the effect is... Because it, because it, it delays the coming into effect of the, the, of the prescriptions drugs. were written for perindropil for a longer period than yeah, well, otherwise would have had right. to have happened. That, that, that's I'm the, well as opposed to a, the nature of the, uh, uh, my lord, I didn't mean to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, no, no, I'm not. Uh, it's I'm just, not just a not point, point of sensitivity on my client, client's part well, that this is not an overcharging case, because that, as it were, is a very different. Not, it's not like trucks. No. Right, um, is, so is, is there anything else? No. Oh, my Lord, so unless you have any further questions, those are our submissions. No, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Sanders. Thank you. Uh, Lord, it's just one reference. You said nothing tells us about the targeting efforts of Serbia Sorry, on, on PCTs. You've fallen into the, 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 the curious sort of 
um, acoustic trap you know, <laughs> that side of the court. Either that or I'm going deaf. I hope you <laughs> Repeat what you were saying. Well, well, uh, it, it's likely to be the hoarseness of my voice, I'm sorry. Yes, okay, go on. No, uh, you, you said in the course of argument, you thought that nothing tells us about the targeting efforts of Servier across the PCTs in terms of their, uh, their marketing and de deflection strategies. There is one reference, I'll simply give it to you. It's the top of page 164, yeah. paragraph 3156. Yeah, okay. Right. Oh, uh, those are all submissions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, you won't be surprised to hear we reserve our judgment, um, and um, we pro will be provided with a, um, with a in draft in the usual way for any typographical or sim similar errors to be corrected, not to invite the court to reconsider uh, any of its um, substantive decision. Uh, please pay attention to the terms of the embargo at the top of the judgment seen there have been a number of recent uh, unfortunate breaches of the embargo. We're encouraged to remind the parties on each appeal of the importance of it. Um, it only remains to thank you all on both sides for um, your, the quality uh, of your submissions in what's been an, an interesting and difficult appeal. And I know when I say all on both sides, that applies to all of the... Um, the team of juniors uh, on both sides and the solicitors as well. I know it's a team effort. Thank you all very much. All right.